Hey everyone, and welcome to our Good Friday video. We're excited that you're watching with us today. As you might have heard already, this Sunday, we are going to be talking about the evidence of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. We believe there's a lot of compelling arguments and evidence that points to the historical fact that Jesus did indeed rise from the dead. Uh, we're going to be uh, talking about that Sunday in a message called Consider This. Uh, that's going to be hitting your feeds this Sunday morning, so make sure you look for that. Uh, but for today, this Good Friday, I thought it made sense to dive into the evidence of Jesus' existence at all as a person, as well of the evidences of his crucifixion. Now, while most scholars will tell you that they believe Jesus not only existed, but was also crucified, there still seems to be some debate in public circles as to whether we can really count on him existing as a person at all. I hope in the rest of this video, I can give you some really strong and compelling reasons to believe that yes, Jesus really did exist and he really was crucified. But before we jump into all that, let's give a quick summation of Jesus' life just in case you're not familiar with his story. According to the Bible, Jesus was born in Bethlehem to the Virgin Mary, who was probably around the age of 13 to 16 at this point, uh, and her husband Joseph. The uh, Bible also says he was born in a manger stall, which is basically a place that animals would eat out of in the barn. Quite a humble entry to the world for the creator of the universe. While we don't know a ton about Jesus' early life, we know he was a quick learner. He was constantly being found in the temple courts, uh, sitting among the teachers and listening and asking them questions. Uh, the Bible even says everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. Jesus began his public ministry around the age of 30. Uh, he also became quite famous in the area for performing miracles, the first of which was turning water into wine at a wedding reception. Jesus continued his ministry by recruiting 12 disciples who were considered the people closest to Jesus, uh, many of whom wrote significant portions of the New Testament. He also continued to perform many different miracles, including healing people who were paralyzed, causing blind men to see and deaf men to hear, uh, and even raising a few people from the dead. But Jesus' ministry was not all about miracles. He also was an incredible teacher. People would gather by the thousands just to hear what the man from Nazareth had to say. In one message now known as the Sermon on the Mount, he gave us the Beatitudes, which are some of the most quoted lines in all of Scripture, such as, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. In another one of his most famous messages, he gave us the Lord's Prayer, probably the most recited prayer in all of mankind. But not everyone responded positively to the teachings of Jesus. One day Jesus gathered his disciples around and asked them, Who do people say that I am? Uh, they responded by saying, Some say you're John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say Jeremiah or one of the other well-known prophets in Scripture. But then he asked them personally, Who do you say I am? Simon stepped up and answered, You are the Messiah, Son of the living God. Now Jesus' response in Scripture tells us a lot about who he was claiming to be. He says this, Jesus replied, You are blessed, Simon, son of John. Because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you, you did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. You see, in this passage of Scripture, we see that Jesus was claiming to be more than just a great teacher or a great prophet. He was claiming to be the very Messiah that people were waiting for. You see, it was a belief in the Jewish religion that there would be a Messiah that would come to set all the Jews free of their shackles and chains. There are even all these prophecies in the Old Testament that talks about a coming Messiah. And now, Jesus was claiming to be this Messiah. This very claim that Jesus was the Messiah was the issue that the Pharisees had with his ministry. They did not agree that Jesus was the Messiah and were constantly trying to step in and disprove him. They hated Jesus in no small part because he was not afraid to call out their unjust and unbiblical practices. 
one of which was turning a church into basically a market so that they could make more money. You see, believers in Judaism at the time believed that the Messiah was coming to set them free of their worldly shackles. They believed that the Messiah would come to overthrow the Roman Empire and set all the Jews free. Jesus was constantly having to correct this ideology by saying things like his kingdom was not an earthly kingdom, and also by saying that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness. Eventually, things reached a boiling point with the Pharisees, and they devised a plot to have Jesus killed. They sent people to bribe one of Jesus' disciples, Judas, and Judas accepted the bribe and betrayed Jesus and turned him over to Roman authorities. Pontius Pilate was a Roman authority at the time and couldn't really find a great reason to crucify Jesus, but Jesus didn't really feel the need to defend himself in front of Pilate. Pilate then famously washed his hands of this issue and handed Jesus over to the Jewish authorities who decided to have him whipped, beaten, and then crucified. Jesus was taken to a place called Golgotha, which can translate into skull, and was crucified and died. So there's a short summary of Jesus' life, just in case you were unfamiliar with his work. Now, obviously, there is a lot more he did than what I listed here, including the very important claim that he actually rose from the dead the Sunday after he was crucified on a Friday. But to hear more about the evidence we believe there is for the resurrection, you're going to have to tune in to our Sunday morning Easter service this Sunday, so be sure to check your feeds when that video comes out again this Sunday morning. But for now, let's dive into some of the strongest pieces of evidence we have that not only supports the very existence of Jesus as a real person, but also supports the claim that he was indeed crucified by the Roman Empire. You can break down the evidence of Jesus' existence into two basic categories, biblical or non-biblical. Let's start with the non-biblical first. The first truly compelling piece of evidence in the non-biblical category are the writings of a man named Tacitus. Now, if you've never heard that name before, I don't blame you, but just to give you a quick history lesson on Tacitus. Tacitus was a Roman historian and politician, and he is also widely regarded as one of the greatest Roman historians by modern scholars. As a young man, Tacitus studied rhetoric in Rome to prepare for a career in law and politics. He advanced steadily throughout the Roman Empire, eventually becoming a senator. After his time in the Senate, he actually became a Roman consul, which was the highest elected political office you could get in the Roman Republic. The ancient Romans actually considered this the second highest level of honor after only Caesar himself. Tacitus then took on the challenge of keeping up the Roman history books, and this included writing and keeping up with all of the important events that happened around some of Rome's most important emperors, one of which was an emperor named Nero. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard the name Nero before, but he is one of the most infamous emperors in all of Roman history, specifically renowned and well-known for his hatred of Christians. And it is in one of his writings documenting Nero's hate for Christians that we see one of the most compelling pieces of secular evidence of the existence of Jesus himself. Tacitus writes this in Book 15 of his Annals. Consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. And the most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. In case you didn't catch it, Christus can be translated into Christ, which is obviously a reference to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and the effect that it had on the rest of the Roman Empire, which Nero was obviously not a fan of. However, Tacitus is not the only Roman historian to reference Jesus. The Roman historian Suetonius, in his Life of Claudius, 
written around 120 AD, refers to the expulsion of Jews from Rome due to disturbances at the instigation of Christus, which is believed to be a reference to Christ, his crucifixion, and the early Christian movement. Also, the Roman historian Josephus in his Jewish Antiquities, written around 93 to 94 AD, mentions Jesus specifically and describes his crucifixion under Pontius Pilate. Now, if you're really a skeptic and don't even believe that crucifixion was a real form of execution that was around back in that day, there have actually been archeological digs done in ancient Rome, and they've discovered heel bones with nails piercing through them, proving that crucifixion was a real form of execution that the Romans liked to employ. So, thanks to the Romans' ability to keep orderly records at the time, we have several pieces of compelling evidence that point us to the existence of Jesus as a person and also to the fact that he was crucified under the banner of the Roman Empire. But what about all the biblical sources? Can we really rely on those as being historical pieces of evidence? The answer to that, I believe, is emphatically yes. The Bible can be considered a legitimate historical document. So let's go over a few of the reasons I believe we can count on the Bible as a credible historical document. Firstly, the Bible was written by more than 40 different authors over a period of roughly 1,500 years, providing us with a diverse range of perspectives and historical accounts that match up to what we now know about ancient history. Also, many of the people and events described in the Bible are also referenced in other historical texts of the time, such as the writings of Josephus and Tacitus, who we talked about earlier, providing external cooperation of biblical accounts. The Bible also has more manuscript evidence than any other ancient text in existence, with over 5,000 Greek manuscripts and fragments found, and thousands of other additional manuscripts in other languages. From the discovery of the ancient Dead Sea Scrolls to our newer findings of Greek translated versions of the Bible, there is more evidence to the accuracy and historical credibility of the Bible than almost any other work in human history. The fact is, we have a source written by more than 40 authors over a huge amount of time that come together to form a cohesive and complete message about the state of the world, the state of humanity, and the life and work of Jesus Christ. The Bible can absolutely be counted on as a credible and historical document. Now, as for evidence in the Bible that Jesus existed, well, I could pretty much cite the entire New Testament. But specifically, all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, include accounts of Jesus' crucifixion and death, with many specific details about the events leading up to it and the very crucifixion itself. Some of them even reference the very time of day that the crucifixion occurred. In Mark chapter 15 it says, They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. So now that we've discussed both biblical and non-biblical pieces of evidence that point to not only the existence of Jesus, but his crucifixion, there's one other point that I'd like to go over with you. I would like to make the argument that the rise of Christianity all throughout not only the Roman Empire, but all of Europe and Asia at the time is in and of itself evidence that points to the existence of Jesus, his crucifixion, and perhaps his resurrection. You see, there's no other plausible alternative explanation for the origin of Christianity apart from the historical reality of the crucifixion. The early Christian movement was founded on the belief that Jesus had raised from the dead, and this belief was based on the testimony of eyewitnesses who claimed to have seen the risen Jesus. If the crucifixion did not happen, it is difficult to explain why early Christians would have come to believe in Jesus' resurrection in the first place. The fact that early Christians were willing to suffer persecution and even death for their belief in the crucified and risen Jesus is further evidence of the historical reality of the event.
So I hope that this video has given you a dangerous curiosity about the case of Jesus's existence, crucifixion, and even his resurrection. If you're a believer watching this video, I hope that I've bolstered your faith and given you some awesome citations to use when asked about the existence of Jesus and his crucifixion. If you're a non-believer watching this video, all I can ask is that you seek out the story of Jesus on your own. Maybe you agree with the points and evidence that I brought forth today and you feel convicted and you're thinking about Jesus in a way you never have before. Or maybe you even disagree with some of the points or maybe some of the evidence that I brought forth today. All I can tell you is that there is life-changing power, love, and forgiveness in the story of Jesus Christ. And I pray that you will seek him out. Let's end the video by reading a quote from the man himself. Keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be open.